I'm Brad, and this is the OSI 300 Trainer Board. All right, so this is one of the rarer items in my collection. This is an OSI 300 trainer board made by a company called Ohio Scientific Instruments. I'll give you two guesses as to which date they're from. Ohio Scientific was founded by husband and wife team Mike and Charity Cheeky in 1975. There are some differing accounts as to where the company's first location was. Some suggest Aurora, a suburb of Cleveland, just above a pizza shop. Other sources and the company's own materials indicate an address in the town of Hiram, just down the road from Hiram College, which they both attended. And this 300 trainer was their company's first major product. Mike and Charity wanted to go after the educational market with products designed to aid students in learning about electronics and computers. OSI would go on to become a very successful producer of microcomputers for personal and business use. From the humble 300 trainer, they produce much more capable machines like the 400 Superboard, the 500, the 600 or Superboard 2, and then the Challenger series of machines such as the Challenger 1, Challenger 2, Challenger 3, and so on. OSI also went after institutional clients and even offered heavy-duty rack-mounted systems for educational and scientific purposes. The high quality of OSI products and the variety of options ensured steady business, allowing them to expand and avoid the fate of many of the other early microcomputing firms like Digital Group, Processor Technology, and so on. The 300 trainer board resulted in over $100,000 in sales. The company's strategy of selling high margin quality products and reinvesting the profits back into the company allowed for substantial growth over the next six years, with sales reaching $20 million annually by 1980, along with a worldwide network of some 400 dealers. However, by 1981, with the market for personal computers consolidating quickly and the need to scale up or be cast aside, it was clear OSI's previous strategy would not be enough going forward, and OSI was sold for $10 million to a company called MACOM, and from that point forward would be a unit of that company. Shortly after the deal was completed, Mike Cheeky departed. A period of turbulence followed with several management changes as MACOM, which was primarily a telecom company, tried to move OSI into producing terminals for business networking. For a time, OSI continued to produce personal and business computers, eventually being renamed MACOM Office Systems. But by the mid-1980s, the OSI brand and product line had all but disappeared. A year or two after MACOM bought OSI, it appears MACOM either sold or licensed OSI or its products to a California company called Spacecom International. In late 1983, OSI apparently wasn't able to raise enough money when a banknote came due, and Bank of America took possession of the company and began to reorganize it while looking for a buyer. Swedish company Isotron, whose subsidiary Isotronic was a major distributor of OSI products in Sweden, bought OSI's assets from Bank of America and for at least a couple of years carried on offering OSI gear. Regardless, by the late 80s, OSI for all intents and purposes appears to have been defunct. Mike and Charity could have enjoyed a comfortable retirement following OSI's sale, but they continued on as inventors, and the pair started several more companies including battery company Z-Power and fuel injector technology company Transonic. Mike sometimes said he sold OSI a little too early, and had he had the right connections in Silicon Valley, OSI might have become a huge technology company like Dell or Compaq. We'll never know for certain, of course, but it's fun to imagine what might have been. Okay, so here's the Model 300 in all its glory. Yeah, well, it's just one board, really. We've got a microprocessor, the famed MOS 6502 up here, and a very early one at that. This is actually probably one of the first computers ever to use one of these. We've also got a staggering 128 bytes of RAM up here, and the rest of the ICs just help move data in and out and feed information to the LED display. The LEDs here tell you which memory address you're looking at currently, and what the data contents of that address are. It's about as basic as you can get. The 300 requires 6 to 8 volts of DC power, and can be powered by either batteries or 6 volt power supply like this one. There isn't really a proper expansion bus, just some pins that allow the connection of an oscilloscope or a teletype for output. Really basic. This being a board intended for the education market, OSI provided a manual of about 20 experiments a student could go through to learn the ins and outs of microprocessors, memory, and so on. The experiments gradually ratcheted up in complexity until the final one, which involves getting a teletype to print the letter A. Ooh. 
So if you've only ever used modern computers, you'll probably find this smattering of switches and LEDs a bit unnerving. But it's actually pretty simple. The 300 brings us down to the most basic form of interface with a computer, literal on and off switches. Computers are at their root like tiny rays of light switches, each with one of two possible states, on or off. For our purposes, off translates to a logical zero, and on translates to a logical one for each bit. Every calculation is performed based on which combinations of these are made. On the 300, we enter everything in binary on those two banks of switches. On the right, we have the address switches. This sets up the location in memory that we are looking at, or depositing data to. We have one bank of three switches and one bank of four. In theory, it would make sense to have four and four since each switch represents a bit and eight bits make a byte. But because the 300 only has a measly 128 bytes of RAM, there's no need for that fourth switch on the left as we'll never get that high up in memory addressing for it to be needed. On the left hand side, we have the data switches. Two banks of four switches each set up one byte of information to deposit to the desired memory address. Each time we want to change the contents of the memory, we set up the address we want to change on the right side and then the data on the left side. The switches are set up in a way that we are entering the binary code for various hexadecimal digits into memory. Now you're probably wondering what all this hexadecimal and binary stuff is about. A lot of people think computers speak binary, but they don't. Computers have no awareness at all of any numbering system. It's just the binary, which only uses ones and zeros to represent numbers, dovetails nicely with a machine composed only of tiny electrical switches that are only capable of on or off states. We've just set those tiny switches up in a way that they correspond to binary, which is much easier to try and work with than decimal. For the purposes of our OSI 300, each switch we set is a bit. Eight bits make one byte. Simple. Sort of. Remember that computers are all about people at the end of the day. A computer is useless unless we can input and receive output of information in a language that we can understand. Now you might be wondering how hexadecimal enters into this. Well again, it's mostly for human benefit. Binary gets more and more confusing for humans the more data is tossed in. My first name, just four letters, looks something like this in binary. Good luck putting that in your contact list. Hexadecimal uses a base 16 numbering system. When you consider that a byte is 8 bits, that means you can break up a byte into two parts, the high and low 4 bits, and represent values from 0 to 15 in each. Hexadecimal thus gives us a convenient way to translate in and out of binary. It's much easier to remember CPU instruction codes, or also as they're known, opcodes, in a two-digit hex format than an eight-digit binary format. For the 6502, for example, there are instructions such as absolute jump, which is similar in function to the familiar go to command in BASIC. The hexadecimal code for absolute jump is 4C. We can see in this table that the number 4 is represented as 0100 in binary, and C is represented as 1100. The 300 has its switch banks set up in a way that they line up with this format. So if you want to make a 4C on the data side, you set the left switches to 0100 and the right to 1100. Simple, right? Now you might be wondering, if we're using these simple two-digit hex codes, why don't we have some kind of, you know, keypad or something here and just enter everything in hex directly? Indeed, later single board and trainer computers did do this. It's just that to have a keypad or keyboard, you then need additional circuitry to translate what is being typed into binary. More circuitry means more cost. In 1975 and 1976, when this trainer was coming out, integrated circuits cost a lot of money. The goal with the OSI 300 was to keep things cheap. And for the most part it works, although I will say one area where they maybe didn't need to cheap out so much are the switches themselves. Man, these are awful. They require quite a bit of force to move, and so you have to use sort of your forefinger on one of the sharp edges here to brace while you move the switch, otherwise the whole unit would slide away. Yeah, these switches are a real bear. They're not the nice toggle switches used in later designs like the Cosmac Elf. Okay, so for our final act, ow! Remember what I said about those switches having sharp edges? Anyways. I'm going to run through a very basic program to show you what the OSI 300 actually does. We're going to take an experiment from the guide here, one of the very first ones. This experiment is basically an infinite loop, similar to, say, 10 go to 10 in BASIC. The first thing we have to do is set up the switches on the OSI 300 according to the manual's instructions. First we set the run switch to the left, or not running mode. Reset is to the left. Load is set to the right. NMI is set to the left. ROM is set to the left. All the address and data switches are down, just to start on the right foot. So looking at our program, 
Basically what we're trying to do is make the machine jump from memory location one back to memory location one over and over again. Now recall that our switches are set up essentially to split a byte in half and allow us with four switches on each side to represent up to 16 digits each. Each switch is set up to represent a power of two just as it is in binary. So the first switch is two to the power of zero, which is one. The next switch is two to the power of one, which is two. The next switch is two to the power of two, which is four. And finally, two to the power of three, which is eight. This is the same on each bank of four switches on both sides. Thus, if we wanted to set a byte of data to a value of 48, on the left I activate the switch that represents 4, and on the right the switch that represents 8. Or if I wanted to do 24, on the left I activate the switch that represents 2, and on the right the switch that represents 4. Easy. Now if I want to reach a number not represented by the switches available, I just have to keep some simple addition in mind. For example, the number 10 can be expressed as 8 plus 2, thus I set the 8 and 2 switches to on, and the computer knows that's 10. If I want 15, or hexadecimal F, 15 is 8 plus 4 plus 2 plus 1, thus all the switches must be set to on. That's sort of how I first learned it, although once you've done it enough times, your brain will simply know which switches correspond to which value. So let's say I want to examine and change memory location 01. The 0 on the left is represented by the leftmost bank of address switches. We leave all those off. Adding the value of the switches on the left, we get 0 plus 0 plus 0, which equals 0. For 1, we need 2 to the power of 0, so we switch the rightmost switch to on, or 1. Adding the values of switches together on this side, 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 1 is 1. Now we are at address 01. To do an absolute jump back to this address, we need to first give the computer that instruction by depositing the appropriate instruction code into this memory location. In our guide here, we see that the absolute jump is represented as 4C in hexadecimal. So on the leftmost four data switches, to represent 4 in hexadecimal, I must set the switch that represents 2 to the power of 2. That's our 4. 0 plus 4 plus 0 plus 0 equals 4. For C, C in hexadecimal equates to the number 12. We know that 12 is 8 plus 4, so in these switches we set 2 to the power of 3 to on, which is 8, and then 2 to the power of 2, which is 4. 8 plus 4 plus 0 plus 0 is 12, or in hex C. Simple, right? Okay, so now that we have the data we want to deposit into this location of memory, we have to tell the computer to actually go ahead and deposit it. This is done with the load switch. To load this data into memory, we simply slide the switch to the left, and then back to the right. Now this is locked into memory, assuming the computer is working properly, which, given that this is 44 years old, is getting to be more of a question, isn't it? Okay, so now we need to move to the next instruction of our 3-byte program. Here we set the address switches to location 0, 2. So we leave the first three switches alone, and the second we do 2 to the power of 1, which is 2. Now for the data switches, I've left them where they were when we entered 4C earlier. It doesn't really matter if they're left that way. As long as we don't slide the load switch, they won't be deposited into memory here. What we want to do now is tell the computer the page number and memory location that it is to jump to, which is page 00, memory location 01. This is what will cause the computer to endlessly loop back to that address. By convention, we give the memory address byte first, and the page byte second. So first we want to deposit a 01 into address 02. Thus, on the data switches, the first four bits are all off, and of the last four bits, only 2 to the power of 0 is left on, which gives us 1, or 0, 1. Let's lock that in with the load switch. Done. Okay, now we need to give the page number. Again, because we only have 128 bytes of RAM, the page number is pretty much always 0. So first we set the address switches to 0, 3. We leave the left three switches all at 0, and we set 2 to the power of 0, which is 1, and 2 to the power of 1, which is 2. 2 plus 1 equals 3. Now we are at address 03. We want to now deposit the page number of the location in RAM which our jump instruction is, which is 0. So we want to just set both banks of data switches to 0 right across, and then do load. Easy peasy. Now if you want to check our program, we can simply change address switches, and as we do, we'll see the contents. So here is address 01, which is a 4C, 02, which is a 01, and 03, which is a 00. 
What we need to do now is let the computer know where our program begins to start. This is done via the reset vector, which is a special memory location that tells the 6502 where to start executing instructions on reset. As the 300 is configured, the reset vector is at 7C and 7D memory locations, respectively. The memory page number of the beginning of our program is stored at 7D, and the memory location within that page is stored at 7C. So we can first set our address switches to 7C, which is 4 plus 2 plus 1, or 7. And then C, we already know, converts from hex to decimal as 12. 12 in binary is 8 plus 4 plus 0 plus 0. Now we are at 7C, we want to set the memory location our program starts at, which is at 0, 1. So we set the left 4 bits to 0 and the right 4 bits to binary 1. Then we do our load to lock it in. Now we change to memory location 7D. In hexadecimal, D stands for the number 13, which is 8 plus 4 plus 0 plus 1 on our switches. Now we are at 7D, and we need to make the contents of that memory the memory page number, which is 00. zero. Done. And now we will load that in. Okay, so now we're ready to light this sucker up. Let's do a quick reset, and then move the switch to run. Now this doesn't look like much, but what we're seeing here on the LEDs is the machine continuously looping back to memory location 01. That slight dimness would look more like flashing if we slowed it down, but because the CPU moves so fast, it just comes up as a dim light. If we compare it to the expected output from the manual, we can see indeed that it's doing exactly what it's been told to do, which is great because that tells us the machine still works. Okay, now I'm going to show you something a little more advanced. Would you believe the OSI 300 can produce sound? Yep. All you need is a stereo amp and a clever program along the lines suggested by OSI in the 300's manual. Essentially what this program does is toggle the output latch by addressing the location of memory on page 02. It then resets it whenever the same operation is done to the memory on page 01. This high and low output oscillation produces a square wave. If we can get our program to do this with just the right timing, we can get a tone we can hear. To make things fully authentic, I'm going to use my parents' 1973 Sony STR222 stereo, which was one of their wedding presents and still works. I'll connect a speaker and then attach a wire going to a standard RCA plug. The center pin is connected to the output latch pin on the 300, while the shield is connected to the ground pin nearby. This in turn is connected to the stereo's tape in port. This is the program I worked up to do the job. The first part of the program toggles page 02, which sets the latch high. Down here we have a series of no operation commands to the CPU, or NOPS. These act as a delay mechanism, forcing the CPU to rest briefly before moving to the next instruction. Then we address page 01, which drops the latch low. Another 10 NOPS slow the machine down some more, before jumping back to the beginning of the program. The more NOPS you add, the longer the program takes to run, and this changes the pitch. If you want to get really clever, you can place this loop inside another timing loop and create different notes. A bit more sophisticated programming and careful timing would actually allow you to play some music. Now, I'm going to spare you watching me slowly enter, check, and correct this program, all while trying to keep my fingers from being sliced off. Alright, first we'll start with the basic tone. Okay, ready? Let's run this thing. Wowzers, that's loud. I'll try and turn it down a bit. But yeah, basically it works. Each time we flip run, away we go. Okay, so that's that. Let's try something a bit more ambitious. A friend of mine from the VC Fed forum named Dave posted this program to try and get the OSI 300 to play Pea's Pudding. He warned me that there would be probably a lot of finagling to do to get the timing and notes right, but we'll give it a go, so to speak. Just for reference, here's what Pea's Pudding should sound like. I'll throw up the lyrics too. Feel free to sing along if the spirit moves you. It's not going to move me though. Some like it in the pot, nine days. <coughs> Sorry. I do enjoy a catchy tune. Anyway, I think you get the idea. Now this is a pretty long program for the OSI 300. I'm going to fast forward the entry again so you don't have to sit for half an hour waiting for me to finish, or hear me cursing as this thing flays my fingertips. I got all kinds of metal slivers as I was entering this program. Actually, somewhere around address 1F, my finger was so cut up I couldn't use it anymore. 
Which reminds me, check out this line I read today in the manual. Not a consumer product. You think? And of course, I have to torture my fingers even more by checking everything I entered. On a program this big, it's very easy to get confused. And trust me, when you get over a certain age, confusion is easier and easier to achieve. Okay, well here we go for all the marbles. <laughs> okay, well like Dave warned me, there's a bit of adjustment needed. Just a bit. Which I would do, except the speaker wire came off and I forgot to heed the manual's warning about attaching the ground wire first to the stereo. Doing it the other way can cause the memory contents to get scrambled and yep, that's just what I just did. Stupid, stupid, stupid. As I mentioned earlier, the final experiment in the manual involves getting the OSI 300 to type out the letter A on the teletype. Essentially, it involves a variation of the previous music program, which you are left to devise yourself. The manual assumes the use of a teletype model ASR33, the gold standard of vintage computing back in the day. The ASR33 was popular in the mid-70s as an input-output device for computers because they could be had relatively inexpensively as surplus. The ASR33 uses the American Standard Code for Information Interchange, or ASCII for short, for encoding and decoding incoming and outgoing characters, rather than the Bodo code used by earlier teletypes, so that's why OSI chose it for this experiment. Basically what you want to do is toggle the output latch in a way that the teletype interprets as the bits for each character. Frankly, I don't have the skill to figure out something that would work, but just for fun, let's fire up my ASR33 for a simulation of what the output would be. Please ignore this machine, sorry please for assistance. Amazing, huh? Here, let's do it again. One can only imagine the sense of accomplishment the student must have felt summoning this Mount Olympus of 6502 programming. Maybe someday I'll take a stab at this for real, but it'll probably take me a while, months maybe, to learn how to program well enough to do it. Which is fine, because that'll give my fingertips enough time to heal. Uh, I found this on eBay after probably about 10-15 years of looking, and uh, it just sort of came up one day and I immediately jumped on it, uh, and that was that. Um, I don't know that it's not fun to use. It depends on what your definition of fun is. You know, this is a this is a learning aid, so it was intended more for uh, engineering, computer science types who sort of had a thing for math, I guess, and a general interest in computing and technology, and you know, had the mind for it, and uh, just wanted to get in on the ground floor of the the microprocessor revolution and understand how the thing worked at a at a very low level. You can definitely buy one if you're if you're into this sort of thing. Um, but the first trick is gonna be finding one. Like I said, I looked for about ten to fifteen years, literally, and never saw one of these come up. And uh, there's actually one sitting on eBay right now. I think the seller's being a little bit overzealous on the price, but not not by tons. This particular machine set me back about 650 US. So it's not huge change. It's not like Rev Zero Apple II level uh, expenditure, but it is a substantial uh, expense. And you know, there are other things that you can buy for a little bit more money, like say an Amiga or, or for less money, like a Commodore Pet that are definitely more interactive, a little more fun to work with. Um, I think again, it's just, it's a first product. Um, this is, you know, 1975. The microprocessor revolution had only really started uh, a couple of years before and it was really just starting to get going in 75. So, you know, this is kind of important. Ohio Scientific, uh, again, is a key pioneering firm and one of the few that consistently succeeded and uh, was around for years um, after many of its uh, contemporaries basically disappeared. So yeah, it's uh, it's definitely desirable from that standpoint. Ohio Scientific stuff generally is very, very collectible. Any of the Challenger computers, the Superboard, 
you name it, there's just this uh, awareness among collectors and people really go for them. They have a, a very classic uh, 70s look and that's always sort of the thing that people are looking for. Well, again, I bought it for the historical reasons. It's, it's Ohio Scientific's first product. Uh, it gives you a really good insight into the sort of teaching aids that they were using uh, back in the 70s. And, um, you know, we've got this really nice early ceramic 6502, which really drives collectors wild when it's uh, loose. So it's kind of neat to see that this one still works after all these years. I really like the early look, the curved traces that were clearly laid out by hand, traces they didn't even bother tinning. Uh, these old machines just have so much personality, uh, much more in my opinion than machines made today. And yeah, um, I have a whole bunch of other Ohio Scientific machines. I have a Challenger 1, a Challenger 2, Challenger 4. So, you know, I'm, I'm pretty seriously into their stuff and having their very first product uh, means a lot to me.